A young woman made a promise that she never broke. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. The times in which the Queen began her reign bear little resemblance to the world of today. And yet the Queen's essential qualities saw her through it all. Her prodigious capacity for hard work and her ability to remain constant, yet adaptable. The 20th century saw so much change and into the 21st. And one thing that I admire the most about her was the fact that she was always ready to adapt to that change. She never dug her heels in and said, look, I became queen in 1952. This is the kind of queen I'm going to be. As what we expected of her as queen changed, she changed to fill that role. Queen Elizabeth met, advised and outlasted dozens of world leaders and figures, including 15 Australian prime ministers, starting with Sir Robert Menzies. I did but see her passing by, and yet I love her till I die. In the UK, she advised every Prime Minister every week for decades on the major issues of the moment. They were discussed, dissected, but never made public. You've just been watching on television. Oh, probably what Prime Minister's you? questions? Well, it's a bit less noisy than it used to be. I don't know if that comes across on the TV. Well, I suppose it is, probably, yes. Yeah, the Queen never thought of her will being pushed onto her Prime Ministers. They come to her, they speak to her, and they, if they want to take her advice, they can. And they usually did, because it's not you don't often get, in any kind of country, a statesman with that kind of experience. As an infant, Elizabeth was not destined to be Queen, but after the abdication of her uncle, Edward VIII, her father became King George VI, and as his eldest child, she was next in line to the throne. The coronation of England's second Queen Elizabeth at Westminster Abbey was the first ever to be televised. I think the Queen embodied a sense of duty. Uh, she was not born to be Queen, of course. Uh, when she was born, she was third in line to the throne and not expecting to ever become the monarch. Uh, but once she realised at the age of 10 that she was, uh, her destiny was uh, assured, uh, she took to it like a duck to water, and uh, she just had this sense of duty uh, which she carried out for the rest of her life. The Queen's sense of duty was shared with her husband, Prince Philip, who was by her side for 73 years. Teachers, are you in the school? <laughs> yes, old teachers and helpers. Signs of intelligence. <laughs> It's the age-old phrase of, it's lonely at the top. And when she had Prince Philip, she had someone, let's say, on the next step down, holding her hand. The world got a sense of that loneliness when she was forced to mourn him at the height of COVID restrictions. Three decades earlier, the Queen faced one of her toughest public tests. Is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. The late 80s and 90s saw the Queen's children embroiled in scandal and controversy. Jeez including the marriage breakdown of the heir to the throne, Prince Charles and Diana Spencer. One of the big mistakes they did make was to put Charles under pressure to marry Diana in the first place, so they were partly to blame for that. And so I think there was blame all round, uh, on, on all sides, but uh, she's not one to, uh, to dwell on things. Uh, she wanted to do the best for the monarchy and the best for their relationship, and so uh, once the divorce had happened, she thought that was going to be uh, the end of it. When the shocking news of Diana's death broke in 1997, the Queen found herself in the rare position of failing to read the public mood. It was a real low point when Diana died, and she did misjudge it, there's no doubt about it. She was up in Scotland looking after William and Harry, and uh, they were very much uh, had the, the uh, William and Harry's uh, 
uh, best interests at heart, uh, but she wasn't judging the, the mood back in London. And it was almost uh, mutinous. And I think for, for a few, few days, some people thought that the, the monarchy itself might be in, in danger. But she was, very much a, she was very much a pragmatist, and she realised she'd made a mistake, and then she corrected it, came down to London, and of course made that uh, televised uh, interview about Diana, and that, uh, that pulled it through. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. The Queen's grandchildren and great-grandchildren have breathed fresh life into the monarchy. But the royal family's travails have continued. The disgrace of Prince Andrew and his involvement with alleged sex trafficker Geoffrey Epstein. And the rupture of Prince Harry and his wife Meghan Markle from the establishment. While most of the Queen's subjects have a sense of familiarity with her, simply because she's been such a visible presence during all of our lifetimes, the reality is she is a singular figure and few people know of her private passions and personality. She had quite an isolated childhood, but she didn't really have, uh, have a lot of interaction with other children. And so it was very much the, uh, the, the corgis and the other pets that she had and the horses. And she learned to ride when she was about four uh, that uh, she interacted with. And of course, that was a great passion for the rest of her life. She uh, had her own race horses and of course, more than, more than 30 dogs. Madonna, this. I don't know whether you noticed her looking at you. I was supposed to say, I do I look all right? <laughs> Here's a funny pony. Oh, that's pretty. <laughs> Spits it out again. On the world stage, she embraced her father's passion for the Commonwealth of Nations, whose modernisation he oversaw as the British Empire disintegrated after the Second World War. Throughout her reign, she travelled regularly to all parts of the Commonwealth. It is with great pleasure that I have returned to Australia and once again address this Parliament as Queen of Australia. The Queen toured Australia many times during her long reign. Well, I think it was a deep love affair between uh, Australia with both the Queen and Prince Philip. Uh, the Queen visited Australia 16 times with Prince Philip. Their first tour in 1954 was absolutely spectacular when about, it was estimated that about 70% of the population actually saw her. And uh, at any opportunity, uh, she would go back to Australia uh, and uh, it was always uh, a, a massive... Uh, a massive love affair between the two and I think again if it hadn't been for the Queen's the, the affection that everyone felt for the Queen uh, obviously the Republican movement might have been a lot stronger but uh, I think she she saw them off for a long time. Even avowed Republicans came to understand Australia would never separate from the United Kingdom as long as she remained on the throne. It comes back to idea of duty she, if she felt that the Australians would be happier without her, if she felt that the Republic was the right thing for Australia to have, then she would have happily have relinquished. She's, she always saw herself as a queen because she thought being a monarch was A, the best thing for that nation, and B, it's because of what the people wanted. Through all of Queen Elizabeth's jubilees, her popularity rarely wavered, and her influence extended across generations. Hey, Michelle, how very yeah. amazing. So, would you like to watch it together? Yes. Let's have a look. Hey, Prince Harry, remember when you told us to bring it at the Invictus Games? Careful what you wish for. Boom. Oh, really? <laughs> Please. Boom. Such a singular force has she been for continuity, so much relied on for her steadiness. The question arises whether any monarch can ever live up to her legacy.
I don't think there'll ever be anyone like her because of the, just the sheer historical accident that she came to the throne so young and at such a, a time of change, and uh, that's not likely to happen again.